Video games make you violent. Oof. That must have been a hard false reality to live under. I, and assumably you, are fortunate enough to have grown up as gamer folk in a world where this expression had either already been or was in the process of being disproved. We know today that this isn't true, and we'll get to some examples of why that is later. But what's important right now is that I disclose to you that for a long time, I've doubted this. I doubt that video games don't make you violent, or in other words, I suppose that under certain conditions it's possible that a video game and a video game alone could be the cause of a person's violent behavior. Why is that? Well, because of a personal experience I've had with guess which hyper-violent game your parents would have never let you play it as a kid. Gather round, losers. Story time. It's easy to forget the technological and cultural impact of Wii Sports Resort. So remember the Wii? It was marketed as this incredible machine whose peripherals would translate your movements one-to-one -one into its games. Turns out that was mostly baloney. I mean, it still did some fun stuff, but it was mostly baloney. So a good few years into the console's life, they put out this attachment, the Wii Motion Plus. This butt plug looking device encased a super accurate gyro sensor which promised to, well, fulfill the console's original promise. And did it? Heck yeah it did! The Wii Motion Plus allowed for games to be developed in which the most minute movement affected by a player could impact their performance in the game. And what better way to demo this than to package it with a sequel to Wii Sports? Whereas Wii Sports scope was broad movements and swings and waggles, Wii Sports Resort was chock full of games where wrist positioning was critical. We weren't in infrared sensor town anymore, we were in Gyro City, now when you go to Gyro City you get what you expect, a pita, fries, and a salad. But as far as the game goes, this is the sort of accuracy they were working with. This joke cost me $20, there's no coming back once I take a bite, I can't do another take. $20, well spent. For context, I tried last weekend working this, like, this joke into, like, my actual dinner. It failed, so I, I've already had dinner and now I have all this food. I don't know what I'm gonna do with it. But, um... I'm 24 fucking years old. I'm still doing this fucking bullshit. I need to be put to rest. One of its games, though, was the main reason you'd want to try this thing out. Freaking, believe it or not, one-to-one -one motion controlled sword fighting. And this is the game that made me mad. Every time I played this game, it was the same story. I'd be fine for a little while, and then suddenly, once I reached a certain difficulty level, I'd just get pissed. I would start slamming stuff when I lost, I'd punch my damn couch, I'd slam my controller against the table. It was like, it was like something I couldn't control, and worse, the same thing would happen with my little sister when she played. For this reason, Wii Sports Resort took its place as the second game which my mom ever had to ban us from playing, a spot it well deserved right next to Duke Nukem for the Game Boy Color. Now here's what never made sense to me about this. So according to a lot of studies, games don't make people violent or aggressive. What are contributing factors to violent behavior though are things like a family history of violence, substance abuse, some societal causes, stuff like that. And that's why I've never been able to wrap my head around this. I mean, I was a Canadian kid that's like the most non-violent demographic you can imagine. This is how old I was. I made, I made this video like three days after Wii Sports Resort came out. Family history of violence? No, not really. I mean, shit, I, I don't know how much reach into the future this video will have, but I was born into probably the last generation in which spanking your kids wasn't socially unacceptable, uh, me being on the receiving end that is. I got, as we say in Italian, a little pak pak culo from time to time when I was being a little bit too much of a, as we say in Greek, a uh, malaka. But that was it. So that's why for a long time I've been unconvinced that the games are incapable of making us violent. Because unless I'm missing something, this game made me and my family violent without any external factors. Unless... Here's the external factor. Motion controls. Due to my personal experiences, I think in general games cannot be a sole factor in aggressive or violent behavior. But for the longest time and in the back of my mind is where I stored this little doubt that this also held true for games whose take on immersion goes a step further. And in the back of my mind is where this little doubt, this little thought, stayed until I got an Oculus Rift this year. Here's a, here's a dramatic reenactment of myself playing Robo Recall for the first time. Customer is aggressive. 
Oh my god. This is incredible. More so than any technology, virtual reality, hereafter referred to as VR, is allowing for the most emergent gameplay video game players have ever seen to take place. That's even if we can call these, these basic movements and interactions gameplay. I don't think that's a strong enough word. While we're still here in the introduction, for the sake of this video, VR is a virtual reality experience which a user interfaces with through a specialized headset which displays stereoscopic 3D images and includes head tracking. In VR, the user experiences the world through the body of some avatar which they are viewing through the eyes of. Additional tracked controllers for things such as hands or legs are optional. So it's VR if it's 3D, it's first person, and there's at least motion control of the head. I specify this because by this definition, neither a plain 3D video screen nor a 2D projection of a game played with motion control are allowed to be called VR. These distinctions will be important later. What is VR going to do? What is it already doing? What are the impacts of this technology on us personally, psychologically, but also on a grander scale, societally? What kinds of conversations should we be having about VR, or what sorts can we be having before it's too late? And in terms of those creating content, aka games for VR, what are their ethical concerns and responsibilities? What are ours as a society that's currently receiving this tech with open arms, it seems? Is it maybe time to reconsider violence in video games in 2019? Now, before talking about games and their effect on us particular to this bleeding edge technology, it's important to take a step back and see where, when, why, and how this whole violence in video games conversation started. He was a video game player in the 90s. She, or, or they rather, were his overprotective paranoid boomer or gen X parents. Uh, can I make it any more obvious? Past the point of novelty. When games started to be more than just dots on a screen that you controlled with a stick and a button, the game started moving closer to the living room and forward into depictions of more faithful action and player input, adults of the world started flipping their shit. Sure, this is a new thing that they didn't grow up with and didn't know what would be the effects of. Seems it should make sense that they might react this way. Now the hypocrisy here is that many of these grown-ups had been on the opposite end of this rodeo before, be it with the movies, comic books, or god forbid rock and roll music that they loved, but that their own parents, priests, or rabbis rallied against. But hey, to be fair, never before had any form of media tried to put realistic looking guns into the hands of kids. I mean, come on. Look, neither side was playing with a full deck here, it looked like. So of course, public interest in the subject of the effects of video games on players drove tons of people into its research. Lucky for me, just after the turn of the millennium, a couple of guys including one Dr. Bushman, stick a uh, figurative pin in him, he'll be important a few times throughout this video, uh, played cowboy to all these old pieces of scientific literature and wrangled them up into a single meta-analytic review, aka a summary of everything that was known about video games and their effects on aggressive behavior at the time. In the end, their analysis of the massive amount of existing research revealed that violent video games increase aggressive behavior in children and young adults. Well, shit. And that's kind of how the subject was left for a while. Video games make people violent. Fuck. I'm gonna convince my mom to give me Ham Thar or Ham Hams Unite now. Except then paradigms began to shift. Duh. Turned out a lot of the studies previously conducted on games and aggression suffered from the same limitation. The correlation causation issue. AKA just cause shit's linked in some way doesn't mean either is the cause or consequence of the other. Many of them delved deep enough to find a link between violent video games and aggression, and assumed this meant that the games were responsible for creating the violence in people. This however isn't logically sound, as it could be also used to argue the case that people with existing violent tendencies would be likely to seek out violent games. Basically, studies up until then had shown that aggressive people play violent games, but the relationship between the two wasn't properly established. People, 
or researchers at least, were no longer satisfied with blaming games for violent behavior and realized that this didn't paint a clear picture. Here's a good example of a work done during these changing mentalities. Violent video games and aggression, causal relationship or byproduct of family violence and intrinsic violence motivation. Dr. Ferguson's coming out here hitting us with a two-parter. Part 1. Do video games cause violence? No. Neither randomized exposure to violent video game conditions nor previous real-life exposure to violent video games caused any differences in aggression. Here he is checking immediate and the regular exposure, now that's a bro. Part 2. Alright, so what are some factors involved with aggressive tendencies? Results indicated that trait aggression, aka personal proneness to aggressiveness, family violence, and male gender were predictive of violent crime, but exposure to violent video games was not. Well, shit, that doesn't help with my case, but hey, neat stuff. Studies like this were extremely valuable to the reception and recognition of gaming as a hobby and games as a medium of entertainment. They not only refuted that the players of violent video games can be categorized as being prone to violent acts, but they highlighted the true combinations of influences of this sort of behavior. While playing violent games is a choice someone who is violent will likely make, they don't make you that way. That's what people started to learn. Now, here's what studies like this didn't rule out. The possibility that playing violent video games could have harmful impacts on people with pre-existing violent tendencies or mental illnesses. Maybe they can be used as a contributing factor, a vicarious experience or way to prepare for a real-life violent act. This is the angle from which the anti-gaming crowd would most often continue to prod from, and still do today, and AC can't blame them for that. That being said, there's still a lot to learn, and a lot of people from both sides are continuously working towards answering new questions. Here's a snapshot of the conversation of violence in video games in the modern age. In 2019, we believe that there is no strong evidence that games are a cause of violent criminal acts. However, some links have been found between games and short-term aggression. As important as it is to acknowledge that, it's just as important to pay mind to the murkiness of it. First of all, measures of aggression are weird and often criticized. They include things like making subjects feed hot sauce to someone. As Dr. Graham Wilson from the University of Glasgow told me in an on-paper interview, thank you again by the way, uh, there is a world of difference between hot sauce and criminal aggression and violence. It's the player's personality that matters more. Now the issue here is that studies from the other end of the line agree with this. They agree that violent behavior does have more to do with someone's personality. So instead, what they've reported to show is evidence that cognitive aggression is a predictor of long-term aggressive personality changes, and that repeatedly and regularly activating one's aggressive thoughts by, I don't know, playing games, can risk aggression becoming part of their personality. And that's a really interesting counter-argument. Or at least it would be if it weren't for another study showing publication bias towards works which show positive links between games and aggression as opposed to those that show none or other. That's why I'm using the word murky to describe the state of the violence in video games conversation in the modern age. There's no evidence for the big scary and potentially important if true claims, but people are finding out some interesting stuff by poking around at the issue at a lot of different places. For example, maybe it's not about if games can make us violent, but it's instead their addicting qualities that we should be worrying about. Or here, remember my whole goofy intro bit with the story of how my family and I got angry playing Wii Sports Resort? Well, in 2014, a group of researchers from the University of Rochester showed through the lens of self-determination theory, a, a psychological framework about how people make motivated decisions, that wholly independent from violent content, a game could make someone aggressive by result of what they call competence impeding. In their experiments, in which they pretty much explored the psychological processes behind rage quitting, they took a few steps to make subjects feel incompetent playing games that included remapping buttons to unmasterable combinations and manipulating games to present a difficulty that can be only described as unfair. They literally made a version of Tetris that would algorithmically determine the worst four possible pieces to dish out per turn, and then pick the absolute worst at a 75% chance. Talk about a Tetris effect! This is someone out there's version of hell! They showed that impeding someone's confidence could result in them having aggressive and violent feelings, and there's no doubt in my mind that that's what we were experiencing with Wii Sports. I mean, the sword fighting is really cool. For a while. The problem, I guess, is intrinsic to designing automated challenges for a motion-controlled game. With every round one, the game kind of just cranks up the reaction time of the AI opponents it's serving you until you reach a critical point at which they're able to counter your every move with just frames to see them coming. It feels unfair and you feel incompetent for being unable to catch them off guard for a clean strike. The fact those strikes are triggered by identical movements of your actual body and the immersion that lends make the aggression even hotter. 
you get some spicy feelings playing that shit. So, while murky, the fact that people are thinking outside of the box and examining the subject every which way is really important. Some have observed that, historically, most studies took a very unsophisticated view of video games, which might be the reason for their weird conclusions. I think I'd attribute this most recent shift in the way games are studied to the fact that many researchers today are people who've grown up with games and, like you and me, participated in the establishment of whatever the hell gaming culture is. These aren't outsiders looking in, you know, trying to compare paper plane glider games to first person shooters. These are gamers who treat the medium properly, don't make goofy mistakes, but most importantly are likely to pick up on the subtleties that researchers of older generations are unable to. I mean, it feels to me like we're in the golden age of psychological research on games, which I think is really cool for as niche as it is. There's still a lot to learn though, especially when it comes to VR, which in its commercially available state is still a very new thing. So let's take a look at what relevant research does exist. So first of all, let me introduce you to a problem I discovered. If you ever find yourself, for whatever reason, researching the psychological effects of VR, you might be led to believe from your first search results that a small wealth of studies already exists on the subject, which is really exciting. And the further you dig into them, the less they make sense. I, I mean, they didn't have this tech back then, did they? Turns out that before the head-mounted displays of today, the term VR was popularly used to describe any sort of computer graphics application. From interactive games to emulations and simulations to 3D videos, the term virtual reality was used often to describe very broadly any visual stimuli which was produced digitally or was some other way virtual. Other, slightly more recent studies seem to understand what VR is, but then do a poor job of explaining how they got their studies to work. For instance, one study that claimed to have players play Grand Theft Auto 4 in and out of VR which, as a gamer, I know is not a feature of that game, and that mods 4 are pretty bad because Grand Theft Auto 4 was not optimized for this sort of perspective or control. And then you take a deeper look and realize, oh, they, they, they somehow projected the game in stereo 3D. I mean, it's not really VR, but I get the point. These common occurrences unfortunately make it a little bit difficult to delve into research on what it is we call VR today. They muddy the results, which is a pain. But once you you who are for whatever reason still researching the subject, discover these mirages and learn to look past them, you don't see very much left. Maybe one or two cactuses. Most studies I could find that proposed there being a difference in how we consume content in this media were about 3D projectors or sole VR headsets. Other studies I found which I considered relevant were about motion controls on their own, most a response to the Wii era of household gaming peripherals. These might not be exactly what I was hoping for, but they were stepping stones technologists needed to take towards the contents of the cardboard box I keep on my desk chair when I'm not using it, the complete package that we call VR today, you know, a headset, motion tracking, and hand controllers. No doubt. But here's where one of this video's primary cruxes is going to be. The assumption that the studied effects of 3D displays and headsets and the studied effects of motion controls are both applicable when it comes to modern VR. As you might remember, when defining VR earlier, we mentioned that motion controls are an optional component. That's true. While some games require them, others work without them. So we're basically going to take a look at their effects separately and assume they add up when, well, added up. Here's a good time to mention that I have no background in psych. I've had experienced help writing this, though. My background's in software engineering, so while that undoubtedly means that there's going to be a whole bit towards the end about technological ethics, it also means that, for the first time, this is my first of this kind of rodeo. So from my perspective, as a technologist, let's say, I see no reason not to assume that the results of studies on general 3D display systems and those on motion controls would both be applicable when it comes to VR. As far as I can tell, they shouldn't contradict or conflict with each other in any way. Nevertheless, I should be pointing out that in the lack of any studies about the exact sort of VR games I've been playing, those where I wear a headset and move my hands about, yada yada, I'm going to be taking what people have learned about VR headsets and 3D and other immersive displays, and I'm going to be taking what people have learned about motion controls, and I'm going to make the assumption that both of these would hold true when paired. So you might remember that in the intro when defining the technology, we mentioned that 3D movies are distinguishable from VR. That while implementations of stereoscopic 3D are certainly a component of VR, they are not the same thing. As far as what they do though, they both immerse the player or viewer, in the most literal sense of the word, by providing you a perception of depth comparable to real life vision. 
So here's another assumption I'm making, which should be easier to swallow. I think when it comes to what effects a 3D display is shown to have on people, we can assume that those effects would at least be true of VR displays as well. Why is that? Well, because the actual source of those effects wouldn't be either technology, but rather their byproduct, immersion. Now, VR displays should no doubt have immersive properties and effects unique to themselves, but whatever 3D does simply by being 3D, I want to assume VR also does for the same reason. So let's talk 3D. 3D TVs, remember when those were a big deal? Uh, no, me neither. But you know who does? Dr. Bushman. In 2014, he and his associate published a study on the mediatory effect presence has on violent video game play. Presence is the word researchers seem to like to use to describe the particular brand of immersion available through VR. Presence is the combination of three phenomena. Place illusion, the sensation of being in a real environment. Body ownership, basically how much you believe that your avatar's virtual body is your own. And of course, plausibility illusion, the feeling that events or actions occurring are actually occurring or could actually be occurring. This one's not unique to VR, it's something you've probably seen in any deep systems driven game or immersive sim where you have the freedom to solve problems as you would, though VR definitely does help. Now no shit, as you can tell from how roundabout I've been at introducing this, Dr. Bushman didn't study how presence affected violent video gameplay in VR, but rather on 3D monitors. Why is that? Well, as he explains, at the time, studies of head-mounted display type VR were already cropping up but with mixed results. He attributed these inconsistencies to the pairing of the awkwardness and novelty of this sort of technology. As he says, these inconsistent effects may be due to the bulky and unfamiliar nature of VR headsets, as relatively few participants typically have experience with VR headsets compared with more popular immersive technologies such as large screens and high-definition images. I mean, it makes sense. Most people have not experienced VR, and anyone's first experience, whether it be after waiting an hour in line at a convention or just in a laboratory setting, is bound to be weird. I can see how the lack of most people's exposure to VR and the fact that a first interaction with it can be as incredible as it can be nauseating makes it really hard to study on a mass scale. There are more variables at play here than just the content of the games, which could be influencing the results. Not too dissimilar to that whole competency impediment concept with the, the remapped controls and unfair difficulties, maybe. So long story short, he studied 3D screens instead, which admittedly would have a much lighter presence, but a sort of presence nonetheless. And of course, 3D media being something most people are familiar with from their movie-going experiences, there was less to worry about in terms of external factors limiting the results. And so in the end, what they found by having participants play violent and non-violent games across different sized displays in 2D and 3D was that violence in 3D had greater impacts on aggression, which were attributed to its immersive condition. Basically, the more present you feel in a game, the angrier you'll feel afterwards if you've played violently. Or maybe another way to put it, if you're a violent player, immersion increases your feelings of aggression. Here's as good a time as any to bring up that Dr. Bushman doesn't have the most spotless record. He's a controversial guy. He's had papers redacted, he's been accused of fabricating moral hubbubs, he's got some beans. But at the end of the day, he's a doctor of psychology specializing in human aggression. Maybe a lot of what he's gone on about has been disproved, but that's fine. Without a character like this, we wouldn't have the current discourse we have today, which is so great. Now that being said, when it comes to technology on the cutting edge, which it's funny to admit 3D displays once were, this is stuff he hasn't necessarily been directly challenged on yet, as far as I could find. So there's some uncertainty here we need to consider. These results might be something worth worrying and learning more about. It's a worry that, personally, I've had making the rounds in my head for a while. It's the but maybe I think might be necessary to add at the end of every video games don't make you violent argument. It's one of the reasons I've wanted to make this video for a long time. Here's one of the things that worries me. One of the earliest virtual reality experiments people have ever done is the walk the plank experience. It's basically a height simulator. A virtual plank exists high atop a city, and you walk across it. Simple enough. These days you can buy a version of it on Steam for like 17 bucks. Outrageous. In cognitive science there's this concept of schemas, the way our brains organize information for storage and retrieval. As a kid, when we learned the schema for dog, it might include things like names of different breeds, physical attributes like having four legs and a tail, and others that make them distinct from, say, a cat, like the noise they make and the fact that they're better. 
As far as what we care about today, we may, for example, have a real-life schema, which includes information about how we behave and respond to things in the real world, and then a media schema, which keeps track of how things in media are to be interacted with. This helps when, say, you watch a violent movie. You store information about how those characters interact in your media schema because, well, you're smart enough to tell that this is just a movie and it's not how you should behave in real life, assuming you're a typically functioning and fully developed adult at least, which honestly is an asterisk I'll mention here is implied basically everywhere throughout this video unless explicitly stated otherwise. Well, a few scholars have proposed that when it comes to VR and the presence we feel when in it, our brains might be fooled into feeding us information from our real life schemas rather than our media ones. Is this real life? Yes. No, uh, 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 uh huh. Yeah, okay, don't now. touch it. Don't. Evidence of this can be traced as far back, they say, as some of those earliest plank simulators and how players respond to them under various levels of sensory feedback. We know it's not real. We observe ourselves putting on a headset to peer into this virtualization, but still we react to the height similarly to how we would if it were actual, and raising the seamlessness of the simulation increases those reactions. If we amp up the frame rate, we react to it more realistically. If we induce haptic feedback by walking on an actual plank rested on the ground exactly where the virtual one would be, we react more realistically. If we know none of this is real, why do we respond with natural fear? And I mean, and pardon my language, but no shit. VR is supposed to try to convince you it's real. I mean, otherwise, what's the point? What's its novelty? Like, as a commercial product, I'm talking. But here's what worries me. For a long time, our greatest guard against those suggesting that video games cause violence is that we can tell the difference between media and reality. But VR, by its nature, has as an objective trying to fool us into believing it's real. As gamers, we see increases in visual fidelity and immersion as progress, always. Does that mean, though, that the direction we're progressing will eventually surpass our guard? I don't know. But when it comes to violence is where I personally begin to have second thoughts. First of all, is violence really something we want to subject ourselves to in this medium? And if there's a chance that increased sensations of presence give us greater feelings of aggression, aggression that our minds might be associating with real-life schemas rather than media ones, is that a problem? Is there a chance that in its current state, or the states they'll no doubt mutate into in the future, will enactments of violence in VR contribute to learning and parts of our brain responsible for interpreting and operating within the real world rather than the virtual? I know that comes off sounding super moral panicky, but we don't really know, right? Before diving into that with only the ability to extrapolate based on what we know about 3D displays in general, let's actually see what studies about modern VR do exist, eh? Violent Video Games in Virtual Reality, Reevaluating the Impact and Rating of Interactive Experiences is a study on, you guessed it, the impacts of violent video games in virtual reality, by Dr. Mark McGill and Dr. Wilson of the Universities of Strathclyde and Glasgow respectively, the latter of which, as you may recall, agreed to answer some questions for me in an on-paper interview. Unlike a lot of studies on games content though, these docs came at it with a tangible goal, a suggestion to the industry. The twist in their study was that it was about game ratings like ERSB, Peggy, and the likes. Basically, like I've been trying to say in this video, proving that VR games affect people differently than their non-VR counterparts should be sufficient in getting them different treatment and consideration, and one of those differences these guys propose should be how we rate them. At the center of their study is Resident Evil 7 for the PlayStation 4, a game selected for its ability to be played either regularly on a TV like any other mediocre to bad first person survival horror game, or in VR using a PSVR headset. And very importantly, at least to these two researchers, these two versions of the game are not rated separately, but instead share one rating with nothing but a little warning about VR creating a sense of presence and immersion. To the Glasgow boys, this is insufficient. This paper is really cool, and it's a good read unlike most of the old-timey game studies I've been checking out a lot. My one issue with it might be their sample size, which is pretty small and might not be generalizable to population, but like Dr. Bushman observed when he decided to study 3D monitors, the elements that make VR VR also make it hard to study on large scale. And since the people here are still the target demographic for these games and headsets, it might be okay. In their study, and on their quest to show that there is what they call a meaningful difference between VR and TV, they describe this concept of visceral realism. Games marketing has historically used the term realism to describe advanced graphics and visual effects. So describing VR as real alone may only suggest realistic portrayals of events and not tell the whole story. They explain that the effects of presence and body ownership are 
for the most part subconscious and inherent. They say that the instinctive nature of the player's disposition and response is the difference here and is what needs to be highlighted when it comes to ratings. The term visceral realism instead they believe better implies that player experiences could feel instinctively, even irrepressibly real. As Dr. Wilson told me in his interview, they found that people felt more personally involved in violence when playing in VR versus on a TV, which is compelling evidence that the violence can feel different in VR, affecting us emotionally and feeling similar to how it does in reality, which is usually very unpleasant. He believes that a more important real-world concern than whether VR violence can make us act differently is how this violent media affects us and who might be affected differently. As they explain in the study itself, when acts of violence are committed against the virtual body of the viewer, their subjective and physiological responses are correspondent to those they'd have were the attacks real. At this point, I don't even think we're in the realm of games anymore. I mean, what are the harmful psychological impacts of having someone assault you, having someone hold a knife at you, of subjecting yourself to a realistic fear of heights? The researchers then run with this and say, hey, there's a meaningful difference here, and maybe slapping a small warning on VR games isn't enough to protect consumers. Which, yeah, holy shit, it probably isn't. It sounds weird admitting it, but VR content, especially that with depictions of first-person violence like Resident Evil 7, might harm the people who choose to purchase it. Uh, I don't know, imagine paying money for a game and then having to go to therapy or something because you experienced a realistic reaction to a virtual trauma. I mean, this isn't something unheard of happening even outside of the realm of VR, like in the case of the Mortal Kombat developer who needed to be treated for PTSD following their work on the game. So yeah, it only makes sense to treat VR content differently in the rating process to ensure that nobody gets hurt or damaged in any way. These ratings are meant to protect consumers from things they might not know about the things they want to buy. Now all this talk of the negative impacts VR experiences could have feels like the right time to mention some of the positive effects it's already been shown to have. By a function of the same elements that might seriously harm someone, presence and body ownership and immersion, VR has also been able to help treat people suffering from serious phobias and anxieties. Immersion therapy is one of the ways we currently treat these issues, by exposing someone to their trigger in a controlled environment. One of the reasons VR treatment is said to work so well is because it has a lasting effect that generalize to the real world, aka virtual experiences can impact our processing of the real world just like real world experiences. VR has been shown to surpass traditional therapy in types of situations where it might be impossible to expose someone to anything close to the circumstances of their trauma. VR was super helpful, for example, in a case where it was used to treat a 9-11 survivor's PTSD in a safe and controlled way. In addition, VR has been shown to help with body image issues and promote exercise both in and out of games. This is something I totally get. It sucks to fail at a video game because of a limitation of your own body, and I've personally experienced how it can motivate you to work on improving yourself. Oh, fuck, fuck, fuck! Yeah, yeah, dude. Guys, hold up, I have a Charlie horse. I fucking screwed up my knee trying to play a sniper in Onward. It sucked having to admit that transitioning in and out of a crouch is not something my body and myself are very good at, which limits the sort of combat roles I can play in this game. But it was a serious motivating factor in me trying to get out of the office more during lunch and just go for walks. So types of VR content have already been demonstrated to affect our psyche in a lot of different ways. Not all negative, like it might have sounded like I've been saying. So let's talk real quick about motion controls before going any further. Like I said before, there's not much I could find specifically about motion controls paired with VR. But when the Wii came out and once again put a gun looking thing into the hands of kids, some folks were a bit peeved, as to be expected this public interest led to a few studies being done. What folks slash parents were most concerned about were games which asked players to mimic violent motions. At the center of attention for a while was the snuff film themed Manhunt 2 for Wii, which had players trigger all manner of murderous actions analogously through gesture based control. After a lot of research, bing bang boom turns out there's nothing really to worry about. Playing these sorts of games and doing the motions does not a violent individual make. Or at least there's no evidence for it. You know, same as for games before the touch and motion generation. As before though, there are a few positive links between motion controls and increased short-term aggression. And once again, they're brought to you in part by Dr. Bushman. In social psychology, there's this thing either called the weapons effect, the weapons priming effect, or the sight of weapons effect, depending on who you're talking to. 
It's something Monsieur over here has spent some time studying. Basically what it is is a description of how people naturally experience increases in aggression when seeing or holding weapons. It's pretty much that old expression, when you're holding a hammer everything looks like a nail, but extended to things like guns. It turns out merely seeing an image of a, a firearm, say, increases our aggression. Holding one is even worse. In 2015, a group of researchers published a study about the effects of realistic gun controllers for video games on perceptions of realism, immersion, and outcome aggression. What they found was compelling evidence that using a realistic firearm controller positively impacts cognitive aggression. They called playing a game with a controller like this a triple whammy in terms of contributing factors of increased aggression. Due to the weapon's effect from the weapons on screen, the immersive violence depicted on screen, and the weapon's effect from holding the aforementioned realistically designed gun controller. Now, as a gamer, I have some problems with this study. That is a great fucking line. But what it comes down to again, I assume, is unfamiliarity with games on the part of the researchers. First of all, they mention first-person shooter games throughout the study, but then in the experiment they have participants play Time Crisis 4, a light gun shooter. This is a different genre. This is a type of game that plays entirely differently to the FPS games they say they're really worried about. And I don't know if you've played a, a light gun game with a, a regular controller, but it's ass. I think they went the wrong way with this study. Instead of picking a game designed for a light gun and then comparing the experience to the outright bad controller version, they should have taken a traditional first-person shooter, which is also playable with motion controls, and compared those experiences. They could have used any of the Wii or Wii U versions of Call of Duty games to do this with, which all have extensive motion control support. I, as a true gamer, should know. Do I think this shows lack of attention to detail in their study? Yes. Do I think it invalidates it, though? Yeah, probably not. I just like to complain. The weapons effect is something with a wealth of research validating it, no questions there. So when they say the results raise concerns about the harmful effects of realistic gun controllers, they might be onto something. But I mean, come on, who'd go ahead and call what we use in VR a realistic firearm controller? The thing looks like a... looks kinda like a... well, not really like much really. Well, here's the issue we've never really faced before when it comes to controllers. When you play the Wii and grab this thing, Sure, maybe it feels a little like a gun, but it certainly doesn't look like one. When you go into the rift, though, and pick up these manettes, they don't look like this anymore. The game world overlays hands onto them. Your hands. And with those hands, your hands, you grip, aim, and squeeze the triggers of virtual guns. So I wouldn't disregard a study like this, because unlike the light guns which they studied, the way a virtual gun is observed can be described as beyond realistic looking. In VR, your controller is not analogous to the weapon you're wielding in-game. Your controller becomes that weapon exactly. The motion capturing technology effortlessly... The motion capturing technology effortlessly... The motion capturing technology... The motion capturing technology effortless... Effort... Effortlessly. The motion capturing technology... The motion capturing technology effortlessly... Effortlessly. The motion capturing technology... The motion capturing technology effortless... Okay, this is the fucking like fifth time I'm trying to get this line down, so I'm gonna read it really, really slowly, and you're just gonna have to put up with this weird. But the motion capturing technology, effort, effort, effortlessly, fuck, the motion capturing technology, the motion capturing technology, effortlessly, 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 the motion capturing technology, effortlessly, effortlessly, effortlessly. I just fucking can't do this. I can't fucking do this. Oh, fucking hell. The motion capturing technology effortlessly. Fuck. What the fuck? I've never had this much trouble with a line. The motion capturing technology effortlessly. Effortlessly? Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. Wait, that's fucking right. The motion capturing technology effortlessly. I can't fucking <laughs> kill me. The motion capturing technology. No, but now I'm in a weird tone. This is this isn't how I ended the last line. <clears throat> the motion capturing technology effortlessly grants you access to abilities no light gun game or. Fuck, I got fucking damn it. Motion capturing technology effortlessly. Effortlessly. Motion capturing technology effortlessly. 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 The motion capturing technology effortlessly grants you access to abilities no light gum. Light gum. The best part is um, after flubbing that line so many times, uh, I guess I didn't even realize that it's one of the lines I flagged to do in person. So that this whole thing has been an exercise in futility. Um, a, at least uh, we got a good joke out of it. But as I was saying, 
uh, 10 to 20 times, the motion capturing technology effortlessly, eff you know what, fuck it, effortlessly grants you access to abilities and... <laughs> I can't, I can't fucking do it. I hate this line. But as I was saying, the motion capturing technology effortlessly grants you access to abilities no light gun game or FPS ever has. You can accurately aim without using sights simply by pointing your hand even directions you're not looking. You can lower and raise your weapons exactly as you wish, manipulate them in any which way, set them down, pick them up, throw them away, anything. Included in the researcher's original concerns was how the effects of these sorts of controllers and the mental link that exists for most people between the guns they represent and aggression could reach a large proportion of people through the great market popularity of shooting games, among other genres. This concern, however, was partly based, I'd say, on their misunderstanding of game genres and the fact that light gun games are not first-person shooters, not in gameplay, not in audience, and definitely not in market share. Nobody really plays these things at home, let's be honest. When it comes to VR in its current state though, I'd say at least half the games with motion controls out there involve firing weapons. Shooting games lend themselves really well to the medium. The design of handheld controllers with grips and triggers are a response to this. Or maybe it's the other way around. Implying I believe VR might have a stronger sight of weapons effect because unlike light gun games you actually see your weapon in your field of view rather than just a 2D reticle projected onto a screen. Assuming this, I think it's easy to understand that VR shooting games can be considered a triple whammy risk factor. You see detailed 3D imagery of weapons, your own and those of others. You're fully immersed and present in a world of 3D violence, and a couple of dongles you hold shape a corporeal feeling of holding a firearm. But again, we're talking short-term, self-reported or convolutedly measured levels of aggression. Spicy not progressions towards or links to serious violent criminal behavior. This isn't enough reason for the people who've called VR an over-the-counter digital boot camp to be suggesting that. After all, as we've learned, the fact that violent individuals tend to play violent games doesn't mean the games make them that way. But one of the points the confused gun controller researchers have might stick. I don't know. So right away they admit that yeah, Cognitive aggression, short-term aggression, is not a measure of current or future behavioral aggression. But they bring up that other researchers have argued that cognitive aggression is the most theoretically useful predictor of long-term aggressive personality changes, and that aggressive thoughts that are repeatedly activated in a person can lead to aggression-related knowledge structures becoming part of their personality. Having aggression be part of your personality is trait aggression. So what they're arguing basically is that repeatedly exposing oneself to immersive, violent, motion-controlled games and the weapons effect with realistic gun controllers can lead to the development of trait aggression. Now to be crystal fucking clear, they're not proving this. This isn't evidence. This is a concern they've risen and have justified, that these sorts of games could lead to aggressive knowledge structures and potentially subsequent aggressive behavior in people. And as a consumer of this sort of media, and more generally as a person living in this world, this does kinda concern me a bit. But like Dr. Wilson says, seeing a sad film may make us temporarily sad and we may cry, but it doesn't induce clinical depression. So why would violent media make someone go out and repeat those acts? Alright, so let's wrap things up and do a little recap of what we've learned so far about the gaming-specific impacts of VR-related technologies. Important question. Does VR media impact us differently than other media? Yes. Due to its distinguishing factor which sets it apart from other media, presence, composed notably of place illusion, plausibility illusion, and body ownership, it would seem so. Though as Dr. Wilson mentions, none of these are inherently problematic in any way that would cause more aggression than TV or monitor games, and it probably comes down more to the personality of the player rather than the game itself. We don't know yet whatever effects will and are being had on human behavior, either in or out of VR games. As he says, there's not really any research in the area. We know that there's the good, the positive impacts of this which can be leveraged for applications like therapy and healthcare. There's the bad, of course, impacts which most would perceive as negative, most importantly the unintended consequences of visceral realism, which improperly expressed to a consumer might cause them mental and psychological harm false memory acquisition, making us suffer physiologically to fabricated and virtual yet vivid events, digital trauma with real life consequences. And then there's the ugly, the real spooky stuff that unlike the good and the bad isn't quite proven as of yet sure, but I think the risk of which deems them worthy of some serious scientific scrutiny. 
This is the ugly learning of violent knowledge by VR's potential to bypass media schemas, our previously thought best defense when it comes to how much influence media can have over us. This is the ugly potential for regular exposure to immersive VR motion controlled violence, games and experiences where the weapon is put straight into your hands to encode aggression within our personalities and change who we are. We don't really know conclusively much about this. Not many people are looking at it, to be fair. But what I think is that if virtual events and experiences stand to have similar effects on people as real events and experiences, what the various stakeholders involved in this technological ecosystem might need to be more considerate of is the gaming content ethically permissible on these platforms. But gaming isn't the only domain in which VR exists. I mean, not even is it just in entertainment. Outside of that industry completely, VR and AR, mind you, have for a long time found roots someplace a little weird. Training. Now, the training industry is a little hard to visualize. Every company, big or small, has to train their workforce for the particularities of their job, and for a long time, training, head to toe, was a completely internal process. But developing and maintaining training material, issuing it, collecting and distributing it, this is a lot of work. That's why a few businesses dedicated to this sort of stuff have cropped up to serve this market. If you've ever worked for a large company, you're probably familiar with these horribly acted, weird HR videos you have to watch from time to time. Well, unless you work for the sort of place with the means to produce video content like that, odds are the clips you watched were part of a training service package that your employer bought or had commissioned from one of these businesses that makes them. Now, that being said, in certain industries, often in extremely complex domains, there's still a need for on-premise internal training material. So the training industry, if you like, can be seen like this. It encapsulates every company creating its own training and all companies producing training content and or offering training services to other industries, businesses, or individual clients. Why are VR and AR such good pairings for it? Well, partly for the same reasons we've discussed relative to the impacts they can have on people from games. The fact that we may perceive and interpret virtual experiences as real in terms of our responses to them and our memory formation means that they can have very similar influence on us compared to real world training. Then of course there's the cost factor. As I've learned, the hotel industry is big on VR training, particularly for its higher-ups to experience what it's like to work on the front lines. There's these intricate VR workspace demos they have for customer service roles with paid voice actors and all sorts of gnarly stuff. VR is also big across the board for workplace safety training, much more impactful interactive safety demonstrations taking the place of simple video presentations. These cut costs by not having to spend resources building training environments or spending to have people travel all over the place to do it on site. You can put a headset on in the comfort of an office and just be transported anywhere else to do anything else. It's practically magic. And of course, though not real, you do get a sort of hands-on experience similar to the real thing that leaves more of an effect on you than watching a clip or not doing it at all as the case may be when costs are too high. Then of course, especially when it comes to AR, augmented reality, you know, stuff where additional details and graphics are overlaid atop a user's view of the real world, there's a lot of medical stuff. There's definitely a lot of what you'd call medical AR apps, just plain application used for diagnostics and treatment, but there's also a wealth of educational and training specific stuff out there. Now, to give you a sense of the scale of this industry from the developer perspective, XRDC, one of the largest VR, AR, and MR conferences in the world, runs a survey amongst developers and publishes the results as a report every year prior to their event. It's kind of like a nice little annual snapshot of this very young industry, and it's interesting to see the progression of it. This year, it turned out that when surveyed about the focus of their current or potential work, education came up as a target of a third of developers. Almost as many mentioned training, and over a fifth specified that their work was medicine or healthcare related, and a few more said that they were doing something for workplace and public safety projects. Like I said, this training industry is kind of hard to put one big cap over. It's very dispersed. Just a rundown of the titles of articles announcing presentations at this conference make that clear. But the point I'm trying to make, I guess, what I'm trying to expose is that to most people, especially the audience I expect to be watching this video, gamers, VR is gaming. Like, it seems like most people are aware of VR games and maybe some other VR entertainment like 360 video and ooh, spooky VR porn. And like, maybe a few people know about the industrial design and visualization applications, but like, Nobody I've spoken with knows about the training aspect. And going back to what we've learned as a possibility when it comes to how immersive violent VR might affect us... Holy fuck! I mean, okay, this is just me talking, this is nobody else. This isn't even necessarily my opinion, this is just me trying to explain what I'd call the elementary mental gymnastics my brain does whenever I think about this. Okay, so video games don't make us violent. Sure, violent behavior has more to do with the individual, but I mean. Can video games make us aggressive in the short term though? Yeah. 
do immersion and presence and plausibility and all that shit amplify that aggression? Some people say it does, so maybe. We know at least that we respond to it realistically, and that's a danger, but whether it can affect how we act, we don't know. Now, can we be tricked into thinking it's real and, and processing what we do in it like it's real? Uh, maybe. And uh, how about if we keep exposing ourselves to this? Is there a possibility of personality change? That regularly playing VR games can turn us into more aggressive people? Well, I mean, there's no real evidence, but some people have suggested that that could be the case. So I guess, maybe? There's a, there's a lot of uncertainty around here, but I mean, come on. Learning to be actually violent from video games? <laughs> Come on, it's not like, you know, we're using the same technology to teach anybody anything else, right? It's not like there are serious benefits when it comes to, like, you know, training people to do things, right? Oh, fuck, wait. I know it's dumb, but I think... I think... There's something really fucked up about the same device I use to transport myself to some unnamed Middle Eastern war zone where I use guns and shit to kill bad guys, being also used to train workers how to keep their asses safe, and aspiring doctors how to perform surgeries, and hotel chain directors how the day-to-day -day work of their employees looks and feels. Look, I don't think video games make you violent, and at least in their current state, despite how the fuck this video sounds, I mostly doubt that VR games are an exception to that rule. But I think it's fucked that I think that, despite looking at the training industry and its potential implications, uh, I mean, I, I don't know. I, I don't know what analogy to make. I don't know if there is one for this. It, it feels like we hold games and entertainment to this different standard because, unlike industrial application, we see them as art. I, I don't know. I, I, it just, even the thought of this is really dissonant to me. I can't run through the flow of, of thinking about this without feeling like there's something wrong, like I'm like I'm putting the wrong shaped block in the wrong shaped hole. Especially when you think about the development of these games and applications. VR expertise is not super common and it takes a lot of time to acquire, so I've heard. So often developers will have had experience across the board, in training, in medicine, in games. Realistically, last week's fire safety demo could be built by the same team making next week's hyper-violent power fantasy. Isn't that strange? Should that concern us? Given that the two largest industries in which VR technology is applied are gaming and training, is it maybe a little weird for game developers to be making violent content on this platform? Or is it incorrect for us to think this way or to be worried about this? There's not much evidence. And after all, a teacher can use a chalkboard to teach a class a lesson, and a serial killer can use one to keep track of... their murders. Or whatever the fuck weird-ass shit a serial killer might want to do with a chalkboard. This is a terrible example. But, like, maybe VR is just a tool. Let's ask some important questions. Can violent skills be learned in VR? In other words, can I go into a violent game and learn something I previously didn't know about committing violence, which then I can take back with me into the real world once I remove my headset? Personally, I think so. I mentioned before, I'm Canadian. We don't really see guns so often up here. They're probably afraid of the cold or something. My experience with them goes as far as the pellet guns I've shot. Uh, I, I also used to collect airsoft guns, which I disarmed in order to take them to conventions for cosplay, and I used to make goofy films with them with my friends. I fired an assault weapon once at a family friend's home out in the country, but in Canada, automatic firing weapons are banned and magazines are limited to only five rounds, so it, it wasn't anything crazy, and it even jammed right after my first shot, and I didn't get a second. So maybe it's just my lack of knowledge and experience, but when I play any of the shooting range of military simulators, which are extremely popular on VR marketplaces, I feel like I come away from them learning something about guns. Like, small things I couldn't have ever gotten by reading about them or watching videos. I feel like I don't think I could honestly say that I don't believe the violent skills can be learned in VR because I once had to Google how a certain gun actually operated in the real world in order to reload it in the game. Even though that's the other way around, it's weird, but stuff like becoming accustomed to how holographic optics work, or just developing the muscle memory to reload a gun. In Onward, one of the games I play a bit, my favorite weapon is this heavy machine gun, whose complicated and time-consuming reload I've seen animated countless times from the first-person perspective in other video games at the simple press of a button. Before having to do it in VR, I didn't really understand the intricacy of it, and when I first started, I fucked up constantly. But I've gotten to a point where I can do it pretty quickly now. I mean, look at this shit, that's impressive, huh? If I didn't tell you I was doing this all with my own hands, you'd probably think this was a Call of Duty animation or some shit. But no, that's what a few hours of experience look like. I've learned how to realistically reload a machine gun, a few assault rifles and handguns, and this sawn-off shotgun, which by the way feels really fun. I mean, sure, it's not real, but I've learned how to get into the swing of things. 
Is that something I should be happy about, or is that something that should worry me? Most people, though, tend to disagree with me on this point, which is why I think maybe it's some of my own personal bias. Dr. Wilson brought up the issues of motion tracking not always being perfect, weapons having no weight, and that a lack of force feedback being limiting factors to the transfer of skills. Yes, you can aim down sights, he says, but the guns have no weight and no kickback, and unrealistic things like auto-aim and auto-spread are still present. I talked to a few friendly players I met in Onward who agreed to share their thoughts about this as well, and they echoed the same points. It turns out that the game attracts a large milsim crowd abbreviation of military simulation, traditionally used to describe variants of airsoft or paintball, and they were quick to point out the limits of skill transfer with current VR. About the, the VR games, um, about the debates about VR games, school yeah. shooters being able to hone their craft, you know, I feel like uh, half the big games that are out on VR that involve guns aren't really realistic. Um, you see some of the military like, VR things, they have the guns and the vests and they can feel things and they're in like a giant room. Mm -hmm. They're actually moving the... I mean, this is good for like a civilian sort of thing. Uh, okay, so the thing about gun stores and stuff like that, and I get that, you, you learn a lot through this, alright? Um, some of these, it doesn't help you reload, alright? Reloading a gun compared to VR is a lot harder. So, it's, it's like like this, you just put it in there, you actually have to rock it in. And yeah, then yeah, yeah, you of for course sure. have to deal with the weight of the weapon to charge it back. Uh, charging handle, you have to obtain it, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. oh. <laughs> I like this better because it's, uh, contact. Yeah. Down. Nice. The ultra-realism. Yeah? That's, that's appealing to you? Absolutely. No HUD. None of that. You're just... Yeah, working. you're just you. Yeah. You don't see a lot of... You don't see a lot of, um... Blood, gore, or anything. Even this is not even close to what it's like in real life, so... Uh, an an another reason is, um... They don't teach you how to work with right? So... I enjoy um, killing people in games, but not... <laughs> none, none real. <laughs> that makes me sound like a psychopath, but you know. I no, no, no. I, I get it. I feel like that's what most people are. I mean, this, this is. I'm not disputing that VR is taking shit to the next level, but at the end of the night, this is a game. Yeah. <laughs> shit. Shit. Yeah, I'm coming. Well, that was one. <laughs> Still, it's enough for now to point out the current limits of this platform and be reassured by them, but VR is an evolving technology. Compare where it was a few years ago to now, and you'll realize why critique and judgment passed on those old things wouldn't necessarily apply today. VR is going to get better, no doubt about it, and as it does, the fidelity of performing any sorts of acts, not just the violent ones, will get better and come closer and closer to reality. So it's important that we understand if and how any transfer might work, says Dr. Wilson. If there was theoretically a one-to-one -one recreation of, for example, a famous monument, and an individual was able to practice moving through it and shooting with a highly realistic gun, then there's scope for risk. But we're some distance away from that. He's referring here to the concerns some have raised that VR could be a digital boot camp which aspiring mass shooters might use to virtually hone their skills in preparation for the real thing. Unfortunately, if it is, there's not much we can do about that. None of the suggestions proponents of ideas like this make any sense at least, but this shouldn't matter so much because, as Dr. Wilson tells, this claim is simply unfounded based on the research. There's no evidence of transfer yet. But I'm getting ahead of myself. More on this in a moment. So on the topic of boot camps, let's flip the script for the next question. Can violent skills be taken into VR? This is hard to answer. There's no real research around this I could find, probably because of how new VR is and how busy people with violent skills typically are. I don't think it's as controversial though for me to say that I wholeheartedly believe this. Do I have any non-anecdotal evidence for this though? Nope, not at all. In my decent time playing Onward, I've noticed a cultural similarity among the player base, which is that a lot of players think very highly of military service members. Often players who perform really well will be asked in the waiting lobbies whether they've served. Others will try to point out behaviors in their teammates from the spectator screen and try to guess when and where they were trained. It's stuff that mostly goes over my head, but it's something I've noticed a lot. You see, is there snow all on my butt? Is there? <laughs> 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 
This is next. This is Gorilla. Do I still have it? Is it still? still have it? It's not. It's done. Oh, yes. We did it, everybody. Plant our flag. Welcome to Death Strip. Oh, this is very tall. Oh my God, this is like a whole tree. <laughs> This is, this is gamer country now, folks. You heard of Donkey Kong country? Well, this is <laughs> gamer country. I can't put this down without it making a big mess. Be ready. The only other story I have is that a very close person in my life who's actively serving tried out my VR setup last time they were around to visit. And when they did, they played really freaking well. I'd set them up in Robo Recall because it was the only game I owned, and I accidentally loaded them into the first boss fight instead of the level I meant for them to try out. And much to my surprise, a level that took me three tries to, to beat when I did it, and for which I had already learned the ropes by clearing the previous stages prior, they were able to take out on their first attempt their first attempt in their first real AAA VR experience. It wasn't just that, but the way they played was really interesting. I mean, Robo Recall is kind of meant to be played with a Keanu Reeves kind of energy. You know, dual wielding, not looking where you're shooting total ninja matrix mayhem. But they played this with cold precision, almost never holding more than one gun at once, aiming down sights, picking off targets one by one despite the enemy's horde approach. It was really impressive, and not a question, one of the reasons I think real-world skill and training for violent situations can be taken into VR and used effectively in games. I'm not even talking about tactics or strategy or anything, I think just having some sort of real combat experience and weapons training can give you a measurable advantage in the second-to-second -second action gameplay these sorts of games serve. It doesn't really make sense to me that it wouldn't. So then, back to what, in my opinion, is probably the most important question related to violence in video games in 2019 or 2020 by the time this fucking video comes out, can violent skills be honed in VR? Can someone with pre-existing violent tendencies apply these to VR in order to improve them, to train, to learn? Can someone fulfill that sensationalist headline we'd all dread to see one day? This week's mass shooter prepared for attack by practicing in virtual reality video games? As a player of these things who's observed personal physical improvements in these sorts of games over time, it makes me wonder. Would, for example, having some sort of muscle memory, no matter how loosely related to the real experience of carrying out the motions of reloading a particular weapon, have any impact on the damages done by such a malicious shooter? I don't know. Like we said before, if the technology keeps advancing, which it seems like it will, the feeling of performing violence in VR will trend closer and closer towards the real thing. Will it ever meet it? Or is there some close but no cigar limit it will infinitely converge towards? I don't know. But will it get to a point where, for the same reason companies buy VR training programs for their worker safety information, will it get to where it's more cost-effective and immersive for a malicious individual to pick out a cool new gaming headset and motion controllers to prepare for this sort of act than to do it any other way? If things keep improving, I don't really see how not. I'm not really prepared to answer whether violent skills today can be honed in VR. Based on my own exposure to the games I've played in this medium, I, I, th I think these sorts of experiences could be able to desensitize someone to violence and fear, and maybe prepare them mentally, but physically? Could playing VR improve whatever skills are necessary to carry out acts of violence, like a sort of training program? Well, remember when we talked about how VR is used in training for various purposes and domains? One I left out is military. Depending on your role and location and responsibilities, as a military trainee, it's possible you'd be exposed at one point or another to some form of VR training. As a training platform, VR has benefits where, you've probably guessed it at this point, it can stand in for otherwise expensive practice environments or situations that are impossible to recreate under control. In particular, flight and vehicle trainings are good applications. But there are, however, less frequently used, boots on the ground training simulations which modern VR FPS games might be proportionate to. Now when it comes to the nitty gritty stuff like weapons drills and field exercises, these are done in real life. We've already brought it up, but 
the weightlessness and lack of feedback inherent to the general purpose peripherals packaged with most headsets doesn't allow them to very accurately emulate the experience of operating a weapon or doing anything really, which then limits the transfer of knowledge back into the real world, blah blah blah. So VR's very limited military use for soldiers is instead focused on team dynamics, including things like tactics and planning for combat scenarios and also adapting to variable conditions like environment and casualties. So while there's an evident line that protects us right now from a reality where specific violence skills can be practiced in virtual worlds for the sake of their improvements in the real one, this technology, albeit in a moderately mutated state, can and is being used to acclimate people to certain experiences they'll be meant to have and to train them on the softer skills required for operating effectively, violently, as a team. An anecdote I have, which occurred while I wasn't recording gameplay, so don't assume what you're seeing right now is what I'm talking about, but one time after spectating the last surviving member of my team in a round of survival in Onward, one of the other spectators, who'd said he recognized one of the tactics this dude was using, asked him if he had served. The guy answered that no, he hadn't, but he'd picked up some army field manuals and had been practicing the techniques and tactics he learned from them in the game to get better and achieve the sorts of miraculous results the rest of us had just witnessed. The dude was a monster, straight discipline, which, and I mean to a lesser degree, holds true for my experience with the game Onward in particular as well. Most of my best VR victories in this tactically focused game were won through communication-enabled teamwork. There are clearly some dudes in there bringing in real-world tactics and commanding their teams to victory, and I'm just happy getting to be a player in those people's game because it's always a blast and you learn a lot. In my experience, it's regularly made a difference in terms of the outcome of every round. So these were interesting questions to ask, but let's go back to what we had discussed the research saying and see what implications there might be now. Does VR violence create violent individuals? No. It's fun to worry, but there's no direct evidence of this, so much like their non-3D video game counterparts, violence likely has much more to do with the individual. However, studies of technology within the range of VR have shown that increased immersion can lead to increased aggression, which has been suggested that in excess could lead to personality changes. Still, like regular games, this is mostly only a risk for people with existing violent tendencies or at risk of developing violent tendencies. Now, something we've yet to bring up directly, there's a difference between learning violent acts and developing violent tendencies. We can learn the motions to draw, aim, fire, and reload a weapon to great effect, but that doesn't come with it violent tendency changes. Same as how we can become momentarily more aggressive without developing a violent personality. So, research pertaining to games and immersive technology, and our exploration of the use of VR in other industrial settings, have shown, to this point, the effects of this platform can make people more aggressive, and that it can be used as a learning and training tool for real-life scenarios. That's as far as it goes. There is no established link here. Do I want to be the guy who tells you in a YouTube video that because the two main applications of VR are gaming and training, that playing violent games is effectively training us to be violent? That VR is, in fact, an over-the-counter virtual bootcamp? Well, quite frankly, yes, fucking absolutely, that'd probably go viral as shit. But am I? Uh, no. We can't draw conclusions from this because this isn't evidence. The media men might make the differ, and you and I or your dog might have strong feelings about it, but this isn't proof. Uh, judging by the hole in the satellite picture. This is as close as it gets. This is just a fun and interesting story about a certain technology and its potentially conflicting effects and applications relative to our social values. But if you're asking, yes, in my opinion, it's probably a good argument as to why there should be more research interest here. All this story reveals to me, personally, is that there's barely any inquiry here into a device that I paid a few hundred bucks for that's sitting into a box next to my computer when I'm not using it. So there's no evidence or anything, and that's all fine and good. But for a moment, before looking at any new research and without any evidence, let's assume the worst. VR is used for training purposes, and it's also used for games, and when gamers play games, just like in training scenarios, they pick up skills. We don't, or might not, actually, but let's pretend that we have a reasonable cause to believe this. Considering this, as a creator of any sort of VR content, whether a game maker, a filmmaker, or whatever, you'd probably have some ethical concerns or considerations surrounding your work and its impact. From an audience's perspective, there are probably kinds of content and subject matter safe to project when viewed on traditional displays, which would be off-limits in VR given the unique ways in which it affects us. Subject matter that, as we've learned, might either cause people psychological harm, or, as we're imagining, teach them certain skills we ought not. From a creator's perspective, if a link is made between their content and harm to or the behavior of their players, 
perhaps it would be best to avoid these sorts of things altogether. I mean, forget imagination, this is something the artistic medium of gaming has seen before. Over the years, many game developers have demonstrated a certain awareness or moral responsibility towards producing certain content which they considered too far. For instance, the designers of 2009's Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2, who had the sensibility to make completely optional and emotionally intense part of the game where the player's character, for various narrative reasons I won't go into, is asked to participate in the shooting of a public airport. Not only did they make the entirety of the level, no Russian, skippable by choice, but they designed it in such a way that if the player does decide to play it, they aren't forced to actually participate in the shooting themselves. The player can just walk through and view the graphic scene being composed by their teammates without actually participating in it if that makes them feel uncomfortable. The games of the last few generations which have begun to touch more on these kinds of mature subjects have done well to show awareness of the limits they think their medium should have. There's a reason no Russian is optional. There's a reason there are no children in open-world sandbox games like Grand Theft Auto. Violence against children, as a good example, is not the sort of subject designers probably want players to experiment with and make their own stories about in these kinds of sandbox games where, well, the draw is that it's a sandbox and you can make whatever good or bad choices you want to fulfill whatever weird and possibly violent or chaotic and power-driven fantasies you might have. No. That's not something even the creators of a totally open game like Grand Theft Auto, which is constantly getting flack from the popular media for its sheer raunch, are very comfortable with. Instead, this subject is reserved in the rare instances where it is brought up in games for telling specific messages. Often, the presence of children in a game is surrounded by restrictions. An open world game that otherwise treats everything, every mechanic, every system as a toy for you to experiment and play with, when it comes to children, the game stops and says, no, this is how you play with this one, there are rules now. That shows some serious maturity, and that this medium is evolved. There are certain things we can expect these days. Games which cover certain topics like sexual violence or mass shooting anywhere close to insensitively are bound to be rejected by the general public and banned from digital marketplaces. Most people don't see these sorts of subject matter and the interactive medium being things which can really shake hands even when discretion is advised. And so what we can expect from developers is not to cover these. We can expect them to know that there's a line that they can't really cross or even dance around without getting some hate. And so when it comes to VR, we'd expect the same sorts of restrictions apply, the same sort of awareness from its developers, right? Well, as someone who owns one of these headsets and often performs searches for games to play on it, let me tell you, it doesn't seem that way. When we say that games don't cause violence, I don't feel like we're talking about stuff like Blood Trail, a VR exclusive game which prides itself on being called the most violent game in VR. What sets this game apart from most VR shooters is its focus on realism. Simulated laws of physics rule the game world. Waves of bodies tear apart and ragdoll by the intense forces applied to them, leaving behind blood splatters of the most supposedly true to life shapes and sizes. There's a sandbox mode, of course, and basically a virtual torture chamber where you can experiment with whatever you want and learn the best ways to off your foes, I guess, in preparation for the main game in which you shoot people. But it's okay, it's okay, because they're not just people, they're fanatical cultists. See, they're bald and everything. And they're also mostly unarmed. And this guy uh, would really much like to be able to snap their necks. A brief scroll through of this game's Steam reviews will reveal that, well, a lot of people aren't super pleased with it, but to a few people, it's fulfilling something that I'm not really sure I'm comfortable talking about. This is just a dumb game, a, a really stupid fucking game, but it's clear it's trying to be, without outright saying it, a murder simulator. Its ability to be that draws in people, and that's some fucking freaky business. Look, I'm all about artistic freedom, and I don't think video games cause violence, I think most of us feel the same, but when we say that, we're not thinking of things like this, this realistic physics and gore-driven cocaine cult shooting game with a torture room mode that's probably giving a few people out there their kicks. If you want it to be, this can be an approximation of mass shooting, it can be an approximation of torture and of murder. I don't know what playing something like this, going into it thinking it's just fun entertainment, might do to you if you're not aware of the unique ways VR can fuck with your mind. It makes me uncomfortable that a game like this would be made and released and sold with the lack of research that exists. Sure, there's no evidence right now for us to worry about, but I don't think that means developers should go all the way to extremes and assume everyone will be safe. It seems pretty unethical and irresponsible. 
Dr. Wilson and associate bring this topic up briefly and less slippery than myself as impermissible content, mentioning that certain red lines might exist for virtual reality content and that we'll need to do more research to determine if, at all, portrayal and interaction with a certain level of sensory fidelity and realism will be unacceptable for whatever reasons. This research will be necessary to determine what guidelines or restrictions might need to be made. They mention this is important in order to protect creators as well as consumers. Content creators, they say, should be able to push the artistic and aesthetic boundaries of their medium without potentially harming their consumers or being falsely accused of causing harm. This isn't the only game like this. I'll, I'll spare you the slew of pornographic VR games that you know exist and instead show you the absolutely ridiculous intersection or intersection, if you will, of sexual and violent content in sex and gun VR. This is not a joke. This is an actual game where you have straight male sex and gun down bad people. I, I don't know. I have not played it. It's just fucked to me that something like this could exist so openly, like not even try to hide itself or anything. How is this shit so easy to access? Why is there so much VR content out there that seems to disregard the socially enforced content rules we've established as a community for games? Is it just because the VR market is so small that there's a lack of awareness of these sorts of things being built? And what are the ethics to consider from the creative side? Well, it turns out it might be more of a cultural thing. I spoke with Dr. Stuart Thiel, an old professor of mine who, on the side of his faculty responsibilities, had at one point been in charge of Concordia University's Game Research Lab. A point that kept coming back up in our interview was that Dr. Thiel was concerned with how creators in this new technology might believe that any old rules would not apply to them, that they could do whatever they wanted and explore uncharted territory in this medium. The excitement of a new technology like this could have a liberating effect on people who wish to try new things previously considered a little weird. People learn what they want to learn, tricking people into learning things is, I mean, I have some experience with that as a university professor, but generally speaking, people learn on their own what they want to learn. You show them the door, they walk through. Mm -hmm. If you make that door video game shaped and kind of fun, then you might get a few more people to walk through it. Mm -hmm. But these are people who are actively choosing to learn a particular skill and, and take away some idea of how they're going to apply that skill. And that's true in the classroom, and it's going to be true to some extent in the video game as well. I, it, but that's, I'm not making the, you know, guns don't kill people, people kill people argument. Yeah, no, no, but you're, yeah, no, I get it. You're basically saying, like, if people are actively trying to, to learn these sorts of things, this is something they can use to learn it, and they will seek it out, but people who are just generally looking to have a good time playing a video game are not necessarily going to be picking up on these things. No, no, like, but I, I see that. It's just, I, I'm not necessarily convinced about all... all all of that. Um, I'm more convinced, or, or more concerned about the fact that people feel that they now have um, an opportunity and a conduit to communicate a message that doesn't have the cultural um, barriers that we put about put, put up about uh, violence in, in our other art forms and our other media. So video games, in particular VR video games, they're newer. Uh, the fact that they're new means people could break the rules. Some yeah. of the sketchy VR porn games you're <laughs> referencing, th this is a new technology, and it's, it's quote-unquote disruptive, um, and so people feel that they don't have to follow certain social conventions, mm -hmm. and I think that that's a bigger concern, but that's not about um, the game perpetuating the, the idea of something problematic necessarily. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's about the people who want to perpetuate these things, having a way to express these things in a way that I think probably isn't healthy. Uh, I don't think it helps people deal with it. I think it helps them spin up and become angry. And I suspect that's more about creating the message and creating a group around a message than any actual game itself. Uh, what is the, the video game they made about the Columbine shooting? I mean, that was new when oh, yeah. RPG Maker just came out. That was a big deal. You could make your own game about yeah. anything. So yeah. someone made a game about that. Uh, and, and, I mean, not really VR. That's as far from reality yeah, yeah, yeah. as you can get. But, like, it, it was around, this is, someone said, I could express this thing that I'm feeling in this way and advance that instead of walking through it in society. And I agree with this point. You have to look no further than another disruptive gaming technology to see the same pattern we're seeing with VR now. Flash had major influence on our perception of what gaming was back in the 90s to 2000s, and probably is to credit for some of the foundation that the industry sits on today, especially the indie scene. 
prior, games were for the most part physical things you needed to go out and buy, products controlled by ratings boards and sold over the counter by stores willing to sell them. Now, games could be published and played directly on the web with nothing but the most basic browser installed on, say, the machines in your grade school's computer lab. The ease with which Flash games could be developed and reached made this a double threat. Not only was it easy to distribute them, but anyone could make them. Flash was a liberative, creative force that showed the world the likes of Heli Attack 2, of a full-fledged series like The Last Stand, of countless archery games. What the fuck was up with all of the archery games? But also, on the darker side, things like the torture game, where you'd point and click on a dangling body to use various torture weapons on it and cause as much damage as possible while seeing how long you could preserve the victim's life. There's even, get this, an option to upload an image of someone else's face to the torturee. Ha ha ha, that's cool, right? No, that's... That's fucked. But despite that, we used to play it all the time in the computer lab at school. See, anything that frees us to produce more creative works or any sort of disruptive technology linked to entertainment will no doubt lead to the development of some fucked up shit. In the case of Flash, its ease of use was unfortunately paired to ease of publication, which is why a bunch of Canadian grade schoolers were able to spend hours peeling skin off a half-naked man's body. Reflecting back on VR now, maybe it's easier to understand how, by granting tons of people access to a whole new medium of entertainment, their creativity is naturally running wild. Freedom to make art also means freedom to make shit, though, and so that's probably what we're seeing happen here, something that's happened many times before in entertainment and even in gaming. Ultimately, though, as the markets mature, the ranges of content we should be seeing coming out of VR devs' heads and studios should normalize out the extremes. So while this is some real fucked up shit, it's probably a necessary phase. So long as it doesn't persist too long, it shouldn't be something to worry about. The bigger issue I see with VR is that while there's little to no evidence to suggest that we actually worry about anything, there's also basically just one study about anything close to the kind of VR I'm talking about, and even it suggests that we need more research on this shit. You know, the kind of VR I've seen is very much alive given the multiplayer lobbies I've had no trouble in finding. The sort of VR that, myself partially included, many people are enjoying on a regular basis. There isn't just the ethics of the creative side to consider when it comes to controlling the progress of VR, however. There's also the role of society at large. At the moment, gaming culture is universally and unconditionally in support of graphical advances and immersive tech. You'll hear people discuss and argue design and mechanics till the world's end, but you'll never hear someone wish the graphics were worse, or that the experience was less immersive. Graphics and immersion, these sorts of things even get the attention of non-gamer folk. They transcend the medium's regular boundaries. When companies show off their latest cutting-edge ray tracing engines or whatever else they're cooking up, we all clap. Always. This view of technology is called technological determinism. Basically, it's the belief that any technological progress is progress in and of itself, in terms of, like, the human race and our advancement. Any new developments and any new learnings are always considered inherently good. Progress towards what is not a question you ask, because it's a belief that you can't stop progress, that technology is the key driver of social change, and then that it shouldn't be stopped. A hard determinist view of technology would, for example, lead us to construct things like nuclear weapons and allow them to determine the way we live. In reality, though, it's much more complex. It's neither technology or society that determines the other, but rather a broad set of multidirectional influences that allow them to co-shape one another. Nukes didn't make the Cold War, just like the stirrup didn't make feudalism, and neither the other ways around. But when it comes to gaming and immersive technologies like VR, any new tech that can sell enough to cover its own costs seems to be welcome at the table. The way we dance around gaming tech, to me, looks a lot like technological determinism, and I think this might be a dangerous view to have, culturally. I mean, I don't think you could argue that it's a sustainable way for us to view games. I, I hate to go all best case futurology for a minute, but if the world doesn't end, what we can expect is that this technology will keep improving and improving. I mean, even just in the next 10 years, what will VR look like? And now that modern smartphones are being used for AR and VR, what's going to happen? Rumor has it that the next generation of VR is going to be a lot about hand tracking, eye tracking, foveated and very focal displays, which have the potential to drastically improve graphical performance and immersion on current gen machines. Little innovations with large impacts like that will just keep happening as time goes on. Someday, far, far, far into the future, unless something halts it, this technology's final form will probably be close to what we'd call indistinguishable from reality. At which point we know, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that violence in it will have negative impacts on people in society. What I'm saying is that we're not there yet, but 
we are heading in that direction now, a direction where we know eventually we'll face an issue. Yes, there's a lot of things that could go wrong and stop us from getting there, but optimistically, if we do, and I'm not talking 20 to 40 years, but if humanity is still around a century or two from now and this tech keeps progressing the way it's trending to, I think eventually there will be a point along this line at which time violence in this medium will be a problem. Now why does this matter? Why am I talking about this now in 2019 or fucking 2020 probably by the time this video comes out? Well, because I think there's also eventually going to be a point at which it will be too late to start establishing any sorts of rules or guidelines, which are probably what we need. There will come a point where if we haven't already considered the way we're progressing, if we haven't already asked ourselves progress towards what, we won't be able to stop it once we realize that maybe we're not heading somewhere we like. Who's to say that point isn't now, or won't be in the next 20 to 40 years? Maybe it's foveated rendering that's the domino piece that seals in the deal. Maybe it's more advanced haptics, maybe it's portability and hand tracking which we now have. Maybe it's some special combination of these which will seal in our doom, I don't know. But what I do know is that with momentum building it can at some point become too late to give things a little bit more thought. It can never be too early though. So let's ask, should we be treating VR differently, socially, and how could we? Well, one way, as Dr. Wilson and associates suggest in their study, is to rate the VR games differently. As they determined when comparing VR and non-VR play of the same game, the two formats led to meaningfully different experiences, which most importantly presents the case that current game ratings may be unsuitable for capturing and conveying VR experiences. They go on to explain basically what I've been saying throughout this whole video, but much less sensationally, that issues of sensitive or extreme content in video games, particularly violence, are a recurring social concern, despite there being no strong evidence that playing violent video games leads to long-term violent or antisocial behavior or cognition, but because of the demonstrable effects its experiences can have, VR introduces a new angle on this debate. When it comes to ratings, they explain that as VR increasingly tends towards realism, it'll be necessary to know how players and users will be affected in order to provide accurate and robust content ratings and descriptions. So of course, the call to action is to push more research into this direction. We currently don't know much about the subject, and if I may add some of my own opinion, not that I haven't throughout this whole video, but it doesn't seem like we're on the right track to know more right now about this subject. It would be a terrible event for them commercially, but maybe creators of VR headsets could be held accountable to fund research into how their disruptive technology might negatively impact us. Maybe like cigarette companies, they could be forced to label their packaging with the potentially ugly consequences the use of their products can have. I mean, side note, but even just the nausea and motion sickness issue, could we force Oculus and HTC and the rest of them to fund research on that? One of the biggest hurdles in finally making the purchase of my own headset was knowing there'd be a chance I'd be one of those people who never quite gets used to it, that I'd constantly feel sick while playing. And honestly, I'm not really out of the woods there yet. I've gotten better, but I can still easily and suddenly get whacked into a cold sweat and a bellyache by the most innocuous situations. And it's bad fucking nausea, it, it's debilitating, fucks you up for a whole day. Gut pains, dizziness, weakness, sweating, dry mouth, and vomit and loose poos to write home about. It's gotten better, but it sucked paying so much money for something that I just couldn't find any decent statistics on. J just give me a percentage, that's all I ask. I, I feel like they should be obliged to tell during the purchase, hey, there is an X percent chance you'll feel incredibly ill when using this product. Fuck me, man, this is, this is stupid money for something that might not work. When it comes to console stuff, VR isn't really vibing. For PlayStation VR, ratings of special case games like Resident Evil 7, which can be played in and out of VR, include a little disclaimer, which isn't enough. Any VR content should be reviewed as a standalone experience, no matter if the same material's been rated before for a different platform. The bigger fish, though, is PC, where most hardcore VR game playing occurs. Steam, for instance, doesn't have expert game content ratings. Anything similar is either added at the discretion of the publisher themselves or generated by the community, like content tags. However, important to note, unlike other retailers who might be restricted from selling physical games to children below the age suggested by the ESRB or PEGI rating on the box, nothing stops a child from just clicking OK and getting whatever they want on Steam. And trust me, a lot of them do. I've seen a lot of kids making a mess of things in tactical military simulators. Sometimes it's just a harmless kid frivolously charging forward into battle, not having been weathered long enough by this world to fear death yet. Peterson! Peterson, calm your tits! Peterson, copy! Do you read? Oh, we freaking out. We freaking out. Peterson! I'm only used in I'm only using two of my syringes on. Peterson gets a two syringe. 
and sometimes it's some Lord of the Flies fucking shit, the organized kids teaming up on you and endlessly spawn killing you, aka hell itself. So another option, aside from rating them differently, should we maybe be selling VR tech and games differently? Sure. But does that then turn the sale of VR headsets into a gun control sort of conversation? No. Because unlike weapons, which no matter what light you shine on them are always weapons, it's the content which is played on these headsets that could be the problematic cause of harm. So if this is the approach we take, selling VR differently, it shouldn't be on the sellers of the headsets but instead on the sales fronts of games that we focus. Should we ask them to take more control over what they publish and sell for VR, or otherwise find some other way to control what certain underprivileged users like children are allowed to buy, or are simple content warnings sufficient? But keep in mind, these are games folks don't just watch from a couch, they wrap them around their whole heads which makes vulnerable their psyche. In general, I think a lot of headaches could be avoided if more awareness were made about how VR experiences are different than traditional screen-based ones. And since this is the case, since there's evidence to prove it, all parties involved in selling the VR experience, whether they be stores, publishers, rating organizations, or even developers, should be held accountable to properly inform their potential customers of what they're getting into. This of course is just my opinion, but we're already seeing some of this sort of content awareness among some VR stakeholders, and it seems like it comes from a place of good intention. For example, a developer of a VR horror game who implemented an out-of-ammo fail state because of what they deemed an otherwise really uncomfortable and frightening experience. So what can each of these groups do to better redirect the VR into what's probably a better track than it's on now? Well, first of all, rating orgs could develop a new rating system specific to VR. The console-based roots of some of these organizations has meant that VR has up until very recently flown outside of the scope of their purpose. With the current and next generation consoles dabbling in it though, this might be the right opportunity for someone like the ESRB to establish a dedicated framework for rating VR content which we could then later apply to the slew of currently unrated PC VR games. At the very least, as VR is currently looking to straddle the gap between console and PC, these organizations can put more effort into rating separately such bifunctional hybrid VR games like Resident Evil 7. Publishers could do more to disclose the intensity of the realism of their games. It's been shown that the disclaimers currently posted might not be enough. This is especially important when the games being published contain sensitive content like violence or anything else that might hurt or disturb someone. Also, gonna sound like a broken record here, they could distinguish more strongly the differences between their games which are playable in and out of VR. Simply including a description of the non-VR mode with a little blurb about VR attached might not be enough. As far as publishers go, it's their job basically to make sure the players see all the signs before heading down the road to VR. Stores, physical and digital, could disclose content warnings on VR games that stand to disturb some players at the point of sale, or even enforce restrictions altogether when it's clear a certain person shouldn't be getting their hands on a game whether by age or some other factor. This is something we'll never be able to eliminate entirely, but stores could definitely enforce policies of informing parents of minors who come in to buy a headset or a VR game for their kid. On the more extreme side, the marketplaces on which VR games are sold could outright ban titles with subject matter unsuitable for entertainment that common sense would tell you are impermissible for VR, at least until some proper studies come out that show the all clear. I'm not for artistic censorship, but I don't think we need to be selling a fucking VR torture room game anywhere. I don't really care what anyone thinks, judge me, whatever, I, I don't think this is right. I think this should be taken down like fucking today. It makes me uncomfortable to think people play this. I, I happen to know a lot of people who are into VR and it would make me really uncomfortable to know that any of them played something like this. This sort of shit, people either are only playing for shock value or to make a fucking point in a video essay or for some sort of dark fucked up reason I don't think a sales platform like Steam should be catering to. Again, at least not until we have actual studies out telling us that this shit is fine. Which, pff, fucking good luck ya bozos. Developers, probably one of the most important groups, can do a lot. First of all, to mitigate the potential harm, they can include safety modes in their games. Many already do offer such accommodations, which was something really surprising to me entering the VR party so late into the game. Often these are referred to as comfort settings, and most have to do with physical and physiological limitations. Most of these display and locomotive options are there to prevent you from bumping into your surroundings, tangling yourself up in cables, or getting too nauseous by sharp, unnatural movements. But there are some games which, on top of considering the physical, also deal with what might be mental health comfort controls. The best example is VR Chat, which enables a personal space option by default, preventing you from seeing any players who approach too closely. Turning it off and letting something like this happen can be a deeply uncomfortable and claustrophobic situation to say the least. VR Chat has a lot of nice-to-have comfort and safety options that other games would do well to follow as a standard. 
Basically what I'm saying is I'd like to see more of this coming from VR devs, just like I'd like to hear more stories of designers acknowledging the unique impacts of their medium and changing experiences that would have been fine to have on a regular screen but are a bit too much on a headset. <sighs> Look, basically there's a difference between seeing someone holding a knife to what's implied to be your neck but is really just the bottom of your TV screen a living room's distance away, and seeing someone hold one to your actual neck. And since this is the case, and not everyone will be cool with that, there should be a way to turn that off. You know, have maybe alternative, less threatening animations for players who still want to play the game in VR, but don't want to have to seek therapy after. So here we are. We've made it to the end of this video. Let's uh, wrap things up with a little recap. Thank you, Matt, for the joke. That's another 20 bucks. Uh, this video's got a budget. Chicken. They got the order wrong. Who the fuck wants okay? Who the fuck wants a chicken souvlaki? Chicken? Lowest level. Here's okay. This is the official souvlaki pita ranking list. Okay, tier list. Chicken. Okay. Beef. Okay. Lamb. Okay. Gyro. This fucking when you order gyro and they fuck up your order and they don't give you something but they give you the lowest fucking possible denominator assholes give me three potatoes i didn't order thanks that makes up for getting literally like three fucking notches down the worst fucking souvlaki dumbasses this is the dumbest fucking bullshit this ruins the video the whole video is fucking trash now because they gave me the wrong fucking souvlaki the potatoes are better than the fucking pizza it's like, it's, and it's cold. You know what? Gyro? That's why I put them in the fridge, because we got them, and I was like, oh, I'll just put them in the fridge. Gyro is great cold. Chicken is bullshit cold. Okay, it's not so bad, but like, it's not as good as, like, Gyro. What have we learned? Well, first of all, violence in video games is a very popular topic, even today. Though we've shown more ways than Wednesday that there are no strong links between violence in games and actual real-world violence, virtual reality is possibly standing to change what we think of as games. Studies of past immersive technologies have demonstrated that what weak influences violent games did have on aggressive thoughts and behaviors were amplified by them. They attributed this to sensations of presence and immersion, both from the visual and motion control side of things, which, when you buy a VR kit these days, is exactly what's in the box. These feelings of presence and body ownership and realism crafted by VR technology and its content developers are exactly the things that can also leave harmful effects on us psychologically. They can make us respond to virtual experiences as though they were real, which is why they're a really good match for both therapy and training. From workplace safety to military applications and treatment of PTSD, VR's ability to convince us of its unrealism can be a powerful learning tool. So the question reads, if this technology is used for learning in other domains, does that mean people will learn from the violent experiences they have gaming with the same technology? Will players of violent VR video games become violent people, pick up violent skills? No. Or probably not. Or maybe. But not yes. Consider the worst case, let's ask ourselves what we can do about this. Creators can be more conscious of what they're making and try not to make horrible fucking garbage. And we, as a society and a culture, can be more aware of the direction VR is progressing and stand up and make noise when or if we don't like it. We can talk to all manner of stakeholders about treating VR a little differently than other games, show them the evidence as to why they ought to. Developers seem to already understand this, but the places games are sold and those who publish them there aren't putting in the effort quite just yet and probably need to be addressed by us. Hopefully sooner rather than later, before anyone gets hurt. In case it wasn't clear, this video is mostly my opinion. Don't take my word as shit, I'm just some dude.
Ah, damn it. Yes, I did a lot of research, and yes, I had a lot of people help me out with either writing or answering interview questions, and trust me, there were originally going to be a lot more interviews, I just got uh, ghosted by a few. But that doesn't change who this video comes from. It's, uh, me. I'm not a journalist, I'm just some dude, some dumb fucking dude. And this is kind of just a big, hopefully well-structured editorial made to raise awareness of something I think more people should be thinking about. My goal isn't to convince you that VR is gonna fucking ruin the world, it's, it's, it's just to make you think about it a little bit more. I'm here talking so the next time someone blindly regurgitates video games don't cause violence, you can offer a but maybe. But maybe VR. But that's all it is. A, a but. I'll be honest, it's been hard playing devil's advocate throughout this whole discussion when most times I entered VR game lobbies expecting to capture some hardcore violent gameplay footage to use in the video, I'd come away with mostly just hope in humanity. If you don't mind, I have a few questions I could ask you guys. Sure, let me just kill my friend here. Perfect. <laughs> Stuff. We're a weird animal. We can spend exuberant amounts of money to put virtual guns in our hands and wear goggles that transport us to non-existent battlefields where we can lay waste to our enemies in gory, immersive bloodbaths. And yet we'll still take the time to make complete goofy asses of ourselves for the sake of having fun. <laughs> Guys, look! We can get a kook! You wanna have a nice cold kook? Hey, I got your quarters! Oh, nice. I'm working out. Sure, the screens and the depthless view they present may keep us protected from harm as they're an easily perceived border between a game world and reality. But as VR permits us to pass through that boundary, or at the very least look into the screen rather than at it, it's clear that what a lot of people see on the other side isn't harmful. Instead, they found the means to be more creative, more expressive, and to make a total mockery of their surroundings. Which is what I think are some of the things people do best. If you're interested in any of the materials I used to prepare this video, I'll have a list of resources in the description. This project has been no doubt my largest, and I couldn't have done it without all of the help I received. I've never actually had help writing a video before, but this one necessitated it. There are too many people to thank, so I'll try to include as many of you willing to be acknowledged in the description as possible. Thanks again of course to Dr. Wilson and Dr. Thiel who agreed to let me interview them, and thanks to those who were willing to take a few minutes out of their games to be questioned by me and onward. That's actually how this whole video began. I wanted it to be like a, a Battlefield reporter sort of bit, but I figured it's a topic that deserves a little bit more seriousness. And that's all I've got. Uh, from my reality to yours, have a decent day. <laughs> You'd think a decade in on this damn website I'd know how to end a video. Um, how about a poem? <clears throat> virtual reality is red, virtual reality is blue. Virtual reality in bed, virtual reality two? That's it. Hello and welcome to the end screen. This is, um, it is, um, 1 18 a.m. on Christmas Eve at this point, December 24th. I've been, uh, just kind of working on this video basically all day today and yesterday and every day. This video has almost killed me, and that's a joke, but you know, most. I don't a few people know this I've said this before but actually what I do um, if it's a little bit if you're like prone to very quickly head to a dark headspace maybe just like pause right now but basically um, sometimes I get a little bit paranoid when you're working on a big video project like this I'm, I'm worried like you know it's it's like a you're you're slowly 
building it up and then I, I wonder like what if like one day I just get hit by a bus and the video just doesn't fucking come out um, this like thing that I want like I'd wish like at least like the work in progress can be released so what I actually do is um, just in case a video does actually kill me uh, I pre-render every basically every night that I work on it I do a pre-render and I upload that to my second channel Ramhoot or now I believe it's called Lamhoot RH and I uh, I schedule it for the future so basically for for this whole video I was scheduling all my backups to upload and like when I say all my backups I mean 30 fucking video backups to upload on uh, May 1st, I, it's just a number of months away, uh, just in case I got hit by a bus, and I'm, I'm saying that, I, I joke about that, but literally like a few days after talking to some friends about that, uh, I saw a lady get hit by a bus on my way to work, and I was like, wow, if I had left early, that could have been me, because I had left late that day. Um, uh, and then that actually I thought about making this video episodic after that some people thought it was episodic after the intro It's it was never meant to be It was always meant to be just one big ass fucking One fat log So to those of you because I know there are a lot of new people um, Who've recently joined for those of you who are not in the loop Typically at the end of the video I do a little thing called an end screen where even at this point, we don't have annotations on YouTube anymore, but um, I still just show up and I just talk about some shit that couldn't really make it into the video. But given that it's uh, now 1.21 a.m. on uh, Christmas Eve and I have plans tomorrow, I'm not going to talk about anything. And and not actually just because of that, but I, I did um, have a plan for this. So basically, th there is a lot of stuff that I, I did want to... Originally, I wanted to just do in the end screen. There were things that um, didn't make it into the final video because either I, I couldn't work them in or I couldn't find any sources for a lot of things. Um, for instance, <laughs> there's going to be like the violence aspect, then on the social aspect. But one of the, one of the things I wanted to talk about on the social aspect was <laughs> virtual reality sex, and not like with like the robots, like I talked, like I did to show that one weird um, sex and gun VR. But this was like uh, more like people having intimate relations with with each other. Um, and there's this thing called the the phantom touch. Uh, which basically like until VR it wasn't really sure like how many people actually could like could feel this or experience this phenomena but um, anyways the, like it was just a really awkward conversation as you can no doubt tell and uh, I could I could not find a single source on uh, VR sex you'd think it'd be a hot topic I don't know what I was talking about, but uh, what I wanted... Oh, there, uh, yeah, other things I want to talk about. I wanted to talk about sports. Um, how basically a lot of the shit that you can you can say about VR and how, you know, these, these physical activities that you do can, like, make you temporarily aggressive. Basically, all of this applies to sports also, but I... These were just discussions that didn't really fit in. My, the video, hopefully, if you watched it this far, you saw that it had kind of a narrative path that I was driving it through. And there were detours I could have taken, but they would have detracted from um, really the road I wanted to take. I'm so tired. So yeah, anyways, there, there are a couple of things, and I have a list of other things, and I can't remember them for the fucking life of me right now. But um, basically what I plan to do is instead of adding them all here, because this video is long enough, it's fucking long enough. Um, what I'm gonna do is, is actually the same thing I did for, um, actually kind of a very similar in tone to this video, the, what I called the Gen X video. Please don't watch it. I don't think it, well, well maybe it does. P people tell me it, it's pretty good, but like, I can't watch that without cringing. And mostly for some video editing hiccups that I did that I'm really, really not uh, happy with, but anyways. Um, but anyways, what I did with that one and what I'm gonna do with this one is make, um, kind of leave this video out for, mm, excuse me, for like a week or two. Oh my God, I just got some phlegm in my throat. Uh, and then once it's had a, a moment to to sit, um, I figure I'm probably gonna really receive a lot of feedback, some positive, some negative. Um, def there are definitely things that I will be corrected on. Like I'm publishing this video knowing that there are a couple of mistakes, um, a couple of inconsistencies, a couple of things I say that are that are 
could be interpreted as outright wrong, but I have a reason for the way I'm saying them, but I'm not, I'm not going to sit here, like, this is a video, it's meant to entertain you really, really quickly, I'm not going to sit here and explain to you why I'm calling a certain thing a certain thing, when really someone else might call it, anyway, I'm talking about the fact that Time Crisis 4 does actually have a first person mode, basically is what I'm saying, and I know people are going to give me shit for that, but that it it's not like f like i'm sorry fuck you <laughs> if you think time crisis 4's first person mode isn't a light gun shooter it's just a fucking light gun shooter it's a light gun shooter where you move a window it's fucking dumb uh but there are a couple of other things like th just the fact that this video took over half a year i don't even know the original start date but the fact that it took so long it was like every day i was working on it there were like new developments in vr and ar that i was like god fucking damn it like i had like extrapolated this idea and then suddenly there was like this clip of uh maybe you've seen it but like that clip of like the pass-through technology they were using for the um the uh ar um helicopter pilot simulator was like, fuck. i was like fuck like if only this like i can't i, I can show the footage but i can't f it's it's too late for my script so i can't anyways there's a lot of shit in this video that um i'm definitely it's very time sensitive it's not just the fact that it had the year in the title it's there was a it's a very it's a very relevant topic right now vr has never been as relevant as right fucking now so yeah, uh, just so basically all that to say, um, if you're interested in whatever the fuck follow up I might make to this, uh, go ahead and check out my second channel or don't don't subscribe to it if you don't want to because it's a fucking mess. Uh, I regularly like upload just like dozens of videos in like a day and it ruins anyone who subscribed to it their subscriber feed because I just I like upload gameplay footage to it sometimes. Um, so don't don't bother subscribing to it. What I'll do is uh, when I make this when and if 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 it's worth it, um, I probably I'll probably do it. But when I if and when I do make this follow up video, what I'll end up doing is uh, I'll make a community uh, post on this channel uh to drive you to that if you're interested um in any of the things so i'll just collect everyone's feedback i figure you know from the gen x video from my experience with that a lot of the feedback will be very very similar amongst people so i'll be able to like um uh, conglomerate conglomerate um there's a word i want to use but it's too late uh, or too early in the morning to uh, find it in my brain and with that, I'm going to cut to some footage of something else while I uh, read off the names of my active patrons, which I just found out I can't do off my phone, so I have to do it on my computer screen. By the way, this is the video. This is the, this is the timeline for it, or as I call it, the slides. These are, these are the slides for the, this, what you're watching basically one as soon as i'm done this i'm gonna turn that off i'm gonna turn this off i'm gonna boop, 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 put it all together i'm gonna put it at the end over here make a little nice edit it'll probably take like an hour and uh and then i'm just gonna hit render and i'm gonna go to sleep and i'm gonna pray that the render is done by before i have to go to my dad's tomorrow for christmas eve Anyways, all that to say, my patrons are you guys who pay me money to make videos sometimes. Uh, I mean, it's a pretty good deal. Some people, some creators charge once a month. I made, this took, like, what? When was my last video? Like, seven months ago? <laughs> I get charged twice a year. Oh, I swear I'm going to make more videos at a regular pace. But we've got... Uh, your boy Austin Green, we got Cosmic Crown, we got Disgruntled Mushroom, we got the final blue man, we've got Glenn Strawn, we've got you know it, you know it, Grant Whalen, oh baby yeah, we've got Isaac Holland, we've got Just Wally, and we've got Kiwi, and we've got Matthew Steven, and we've got Nathan Walker, and we've got uh, Tito's. And we've got Vinjok, and we've got William Van Zant, and that's all you motherfuckers. And um, I do have something important to say. I was gonna make a Patreon post, but I totally fucking forgot. Uh, if you are one of the patrons, or if you're someone considering patronizing me, that's <laughs> I, I reorganized my tier list and I created like a, a tier below what some of you guys are are actually like currently uh, pledging to me, but it didn't. It doesn't seem like it automatically gave it to you, which is weird. So, like, feel free, like, honestly, I don't give a f I don't need your pledges, but I, I do really appreciate them. But, like, 
feel free to uh, like readjust. Like I think I, I've I've been in this situation before with people I Patreon. I think what I had to do was uh, like cancel 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 my pledge and then repledge, and then I got the thing. Or I think you can actually when you edit your pledge, if you just click edit and then click save, it automatically does it. But it's kind of shit that like on my end I can't automatically give you guys a thing. Um, I think I basically added a new benefit where uh, you will receive my scripts, which uh, I guess for this one I'll do. Uh, oh, we're gonna have to cut this short because I'm feeling a rumbly in my tumbly. I gotta take a shit. Um, but anyways, if any, if you enjoyed any part of this video other than this bit, because this bit is bullshit, uh, you, if you're interested in supporting my dumbass, you can join the rest of these uh, folks, lovely folks on uh, Patreon and give me like a, one Canadian dollar. That gives me about, uh, I can go to the Dollarama and pick up a pencil or something. But honestly, a better way and a, a more personal way to support me that I really enjoy much more is uh, if you're interested, I sell multiple t-shirts. The bit is that I design one t-shirt per um, video. So you can basically browse through my shirts as if you browse through my uploads, um, which I think is pretty cool. Most of the time, it's it's the shirt is based on a joke in the video. I don't know what it'll be for this one, but um, hopefully it'll be out at the same time as the video. If if it's not, it might be a few days later. I'll tweet about it. It'll it'll be up there. And if you get a sh if you get a shirt, that's really cool. I that's like the because this is the thing. I don't need, I don't really really need support. It's really really appreciated, but. If you're gonna, if you're really interested, and you, I mean, it does cost much more than a than a, than a Patreon pledge, but um, I think it's really really cool just to know that like someone is wearing something I made, and if you send me a, a picture of yourself in a goofy ass shirt, uh, I will most likely, in a, especially if it's in a strange place, I will most definitely fucking retweet that shit. The problem is a lot of my shirts, I really really like the designs that I come up with, but like too many of them have my face on them. And so I can't wear them myself. Like any one of the shirts that does not have my face, I have. Like I, I have one where it's just my face in a toilet, and it's for the one where I uh, I made that video about Resident Evil 7 called I'm Sick and Tired of Resident Evil 7, where the joke is that I was actually sick when I recorded the video. So I, I was just like sneezing during the recording and it was fucking horrible and it was such a good joke. Get it? Because I'm sick and tired of Resident Evil 7 is fucking great. But I can't wear that shirt because it has my own face. I've had shirts taken down for like weird... They wouldn't let me sell a shirt with... Well, eventually they did, but it was it was, a uphill, it was an uphill battle to, let, to get them to let me sell a shirt with a picture of myself as a child on it. Because they thought it was just a picture of some child. Like, <laughs> which I get is totally fucking weird, but like it was... It was me as a kid. Anyways, I did, and there was a copyright issue with that one, but I did some weird shit to make it pass, and it passed, and it is a fucking weird shirt right now. So many of those shirts started off as an idea and then got, like, flagged too many times and have just mutated to the point that they're, like, the original concept is just not there anymore. It's not present. The shirt is just something else. I'm sorry, I'm not even making eye contact with the camera. My, I'm so tired. I wanted this end screen to be, like, a minute. It's probably gonna be fucking ten. Anyways, that's it. Uh, please anticipate the uh, follow-up video sometime. Well, I don't fucking know. And again, don't don't bother if you if you want to see that video and you don't want to subscribe to my second channel. That is 100% fine. You don't need to. My second channel is, like I said, is a garbage dump. I'll be posting it. I'll be community tabbing whatever the fuck it is to this page, and you will, if you are interested, you will see it. It's been a really strange year. Oh yeah, I know some of you guys were hoping that uh, I would do the uh, a Game of the Year video. For those of you not in the loop, every year I do a Game of the Year video, but the the, the, the bit is that um, like halfway through, the, the games on the list are not games. Like, I have awarded Game of the Year to a friend of mine once. I have awarded Game of the Year to a festival in Wisconsin. I have, and you know, enough said, you can go watch those if you want. And... Oh shit, my camera's out of space. I got turned off. Okay, everybody, that's it. My camera's officially out of memory. I gotta fucking go. Bye-bye.